your ideas, uh, talking about uh, context, commitment, and consensus as we do our, our work as anthropologists and, and archaeologists. Uh, theme is a bit obscure, but uh, the future's past. Uh, each present is once an imagined future. Um, so I'm going to weave through these bigger ideas and try to come back to them at the end as I give you details on page 12 and 13. Um, I actually came up with uh, this way of, uh, uh, of tying these ideas together. I was invited over the round table at WSU by the Plattsburgh Center last spring. We all had 10 or 15 minutes. And he said, what are we going to do in 10 or 15 minutes? And he said, well, we'll, we'll wax philosophical. So I found a philosopher. It's a philosopher I actually ran into in Copenhagen. And um, this is Democritus. I'll tell you a little bit about him as it relates to these bigger ideas and themes, and then come back to our philosopher again at the end. So I do want to thank everybody here today, uh, the Grand County PD, the Wanapum, Rex, and especially our A-team, Alicia Woods, Angela Neller, and Angela Buck, for allowing us uh, to get into the collection, uh, working with us, uh, and uh, Alicia Woods from the State Park, and obviously our two Angelas here um, uh, with uh, the one form of the repository. I tried to type them in, A. Woods, but kept coming up B. Neller and C. Buck. So I actually had to start the bottom to type at the top. A in there. But thank you very much. That's the lady there. So Democritus. If you have to pull a philosopher out of the hat to ten, for two, 10, 15 minutes of uh, waxing uh, philosophical, why not Democritus? Uh, 2,500 years or so, uh, probably part Greek, part Persian. He is pre-Socratic. He was one of the early uh, atoms, thinking about how everything is related, uh, ultimately, at a molecular or atomic level. They didn't have the science in those days to show how atoms work, or even subatomic particles. But they were working with the idea of life, and death, and decay. And uh, so they were really uh, early precursors to uh, anthropologists and archaeologists, but also scientists generally. And so you can go back and look at Democritus' life, his philosophy, you can find anthropological themes like cultural evolution. Uh, he, he did comparative studies of political systems. Uh, in the, the theory of knowledge and material cosmos, he knew everything was linked together somehow in, in terms of particles, atoms. Um, he didn't have it all right. But uh, it was a set us on our modern course of science. He was also into ethics, um, and he was a pragmatist, and his, that rubbed off in most of his life. He was also called the laughing philosopher. I think he would have fit in really good with our crowd today. We all have that sense of humor. Right, that's right. He was thought of as a predictor, uh, and uh, he declined whenever possible to, to make predictions. Uh, but he was supposed to be really good at telling the weather. Anyway, I ran into uh, Democritus in Copenhagen because this painting from the 17th century, the 1600s, was there by this Italian artist. And uh, I don't know if you can see that very well, but he looks a little, uh, uh, down, maybe downcast, maybe not. He's definitely deep in thought. He's surrounded by all those bones, all of the evidence of the cave thinking about how we're all related together and, and thinking into the past about where we all come from. So um, the Adam and the Adamus uh, do raise uh, ideas about technologies that we do want to use as anthropologists and archaeologists, as scientists, ultimately in places like our archaeological sites along the river, KT 12 and 13. So dating methods and applications around dating methods are related to our knowledge of atoms, uh, our, our understanding of paleoecology and environmental archaeology uh, also come from these technologies that we're trying to adapt, learn ourselves and adapt, uh, and 
not just uh, in the context of doing work out on the river, which is going on all the time, trying to save sites and, and record them and, and better understand them, but also in our collections. So the KT 1213 story develops also in terms of applying the sciences to the collections we already have or are carrying them. So KT 12 and 13 are up here just north of Vantage. Uh, they represent some of the clustering of house features that have been discovered, especially going north from here. There's uh, four major sets of house clusters that are spread between, uh, you know, a good ten sites uh, going up the river. And KT 12 and 13 were excavated by Robert Kidd with Gringo at the University of Washington. And his thesis that became part of Gringo's study and publication on the Ramapon uh, Reservoir are really some of the, uh, the bright spots in the history of that uh, project. Right it's amazing to get into the records that, again, Angela and Angela and Alicia have shared with us. Uh, even more recently, the Bird Museum found this large format map that they had done all by hand, all drawn of the KT-12 French practice site with House 10, where they spent most of their time working. Great photographs. Uh, uh, we haven't really worked with the negatives, but where we have black and white prints, we've uh, done some scanning and some digital uh, preservation of these. You see there's a little bit of uh, dust there. The trains through House 10, two guys there. Uh, photography recorded in great detail in drawings, but also in photographs. This is the uh, east wall of House 10. So we can do the archaeology of archaeology and try to preserve and propagate this record digitally. A couple years ago, I was here and shared a talk with uh, Henry Risden and Eston Vargas. Eston was doing work to uh, radiocarbon date these houses. Um, and uh, Henry had been doing a thesis on putting together data on uh, the radiocarbon dates of houses throughout the Columbia River uh, system all the way up into Canada. Well, uh, one of the things that Eston found was some bison remains. And uh, he did date one of these uh, tow bones, phalanx, to about 2,200 uh, BP. Matt Johnson here today is Dr. Lewinsky here yet. Uh, Dr. Lewinsky's worked with all of these students, uh, and Matt's probably going to take this on for a thesis project to do a more thorough, full evaluation of the fauna from K 12 and 13. This is the, the pit. Uh, the house had a hole in the wall, KT 12. You see the trenches, uh, not quite block excavation, but those are large trenches. Uh, and some of the excavations go down below the house floor. And Eston's dates, one of the house floors at about 1900 years ago, and just below the bottom house floor, uh, 2300 years ago. So here, here's our uh, Corel Draw version of some of, again, the large format profiles that were recorded by Kid. This is KT12 with those two dates. Eston's uh, count of fauna over there in the graph on the left shows concentrations of bone uh, in different levels. That all has to really be done more thoroughly and completely and accurately. Uh, David Shelman, is David here? Alexis Dyson, two more students who worked with Dr. Levinsky, and that will get back into their work. Uh, they did another unit and looked at the ratio of burned and unburned bone there in the different layers. They found envelope, uh, which is especially exciting to Dr. Kubinski. That's one of his specialties. That's a very young role for himself. From my understanding, he was the geology curator at Eco Park and did a lot of the recording and collecting the samples that we still have with his names on. Uh, for those of you who are in the local lore, uh, the archaeology lore, Rolls themselves a very uh, famous professor uh, once at WSU. And the Geoarchaeology Geo Award is given out internationally in his name. 
Chris Moose uh, did some particle size analysis with a, a laser uh, particle size counter with myself and Dr. Ely and uh, in, a, in a class that Dr. Lubinsky was teaching. And so there are also sediments from these sites in these, in these collections that can still be analyzed that can tell us a lot about what's going on in the different terraces, but also what's happening in individual occupations of the house. Uh, so moving into the bigger story of uh, cultural evolution, political systems, again, uh, uh, we need to be looking at a more regional picture of what's happening with populations through time. So regional models of intensifying resource use, managing resources is one of the things we want to understand in the bigger picture. Uh, not just scientifically, but also in the sense of understanding societies uh, in terms of households and communities uh, that put uh, people back in the picture of our archaeological reconstruction. Uh, not to ignore the importance of archaeological materials and sites for reconstructing climate change and understanding resources like salmon, uh, big game, and other resources that come to our uh, attention that need uh, intervention with some of the disruption of the environment that we have created. So uh, just to briefly revisit uh, some of uh, Edry's work, uh, she reviewed Chatter's and Prentice and Goodale's work, uh, combined it with some work by another one of our students, Witkowski, and she was able to document across all three regions trends in house settlement and uh, begin to ask questions about how much of this pattern of up and down is due to population increase or decrease, how much might be due to the geological processes that are either destroying or preserving archaeological features like houses, or how much is just due to sampling bias uh, from the history of our work uh, in reservoir areas. The work that Wiskowski did that uh, Edry tied into this bigger model uh, is also supported uh, by work at sites like uh, Sunset Creek and uh, some of Gringo's other sites, and then um, not the Sunset Creek, the Gringo site, but some of the other sites that Gringo worked on, and then some of the radiocarbon dates we were able to collect, Wiskowski and Megan McGuire, and uh, see these trends uh, through here that we're also trying to link up to climate as it might affect resource changes, especially salmon. Edry was able to calibrate radiocarbon dates for the first time and look at the, the, the linear relationship here between the dates that the labs give and then the calibrations of the dates that are possible with uh, the, the, the correction. The C14 correction based on the amount of C14 in the atmosphere. Even with the corrections, or even considering the possibility that the corrections throw these results off, you still see some gaps. And again, Edward did a really good job in her thesis about raising the potential uh, for three, at least three different kinds of ways of explaining uh, this archaeological record, uh, tying it to regional settlement intensification of resources, but also trying to think of uh, all of these populations in terms of households and communities that were interacting with each other over this entire stretch of the Columbia Plateau and the Columbia River going all the way up into uh, Canada. Again, Witkowski had looked at uh, just in this, this vantage area, uh, the radiocarbon dates that she had gathered together and added to the wire. 17 of the house dates fell into the end of the medieval warming period. So there could be an indication here that there are climatic trends and underlying resource uh, availability in people's choices to live in houses, at least in the houses that we have preserved and have uh, excavated records. And we put this together in a bigger picture. Um, we notice that there's a gap here uh, where the Columbia landslides were. This is the timing of the Columbia landslides, and it, it seemed to interrupt the sequence of states we have for houses in this area. We can't say that that's a cause, but certainly a correspondence. Also, looking further up the river, uh, 
Sarah Campbell in her dissertation had built population indices, and we see that the house states in this area do rise or become more numerous as the population index increases in the upper middle of Columbia, as in the Chief Joseph uh, Reservoir area. Um, this uh, blue isotope line is, is a proxy for climate change. So this is a warmer period right here, the medieval warming period. I'm sorry, it's after the medieval warming period. This is the 12th century drought where we are here. That's the medieval warming period right here. Well, so theories of knowledge, uh, none of that can be conclusive. All the work we do at the university with the little time and resources we have uh, is uh, their pilot projects. And in many ways, we are as frustrated as Democritus was originally with his ability to understand the world. Because we have these tools, we have these ideas, but we don't have the money to make them work, we don't have the sample sizes we need, and um, even if we did, we usually raise more questions in trying to adapt these techniques to our work than we're answering. Uh, AMS dating has been around now for a long time. The prices are dropping, but we can barely, you know, afford three or four of these a year. Uh, but there's uh, a need for hundreds of dates uh, uh, that could be used to fill in in detail the picture of the Columbia Plateau. Make it as detailed a record of people's households and communities as we have in the American Southwest, as we do have in parts of Europe. So uh, sourcing stone and bone, uh, trace element work, uh, there's, there's great uh, first experiments of this in the Columbia Plateau, but we haven't done isotopes we're just beginning to work with. Joe talks about DNA, which is coming online, and then there are residue these were points we were important to raise last spring for WSU because WSU is poised as a research one institution to take on a lot of this kind of work. And they have a very well known graduate program, not to be biased, uh, masters and PhD students who can do this work. Not free, but. So on the isotope score, we played, again, these are pilot projects, we played with this a little bit too. Uh, we measured out the vertebra we had from KG-12 to 13. Uh, Dr. Lubensky, how did Sean do you know, do this? And Sean's now at the University of Idaho. Uh, this is an average for Chinook, according to the experimental database. This is an average for Steelhead. All of these were larger than Chinook uh, today. So big fish. Interestingly enough, one of Joe's students, uh, Victoria Fredrickson, found that the one of these larger vertebrae actually seen, this is initial, seemed to match sockeye. So that would have been a very large sockeye. And if more of that is sockeye, again, that's where DNA would tell. Uh, that's pretty amazing to know about the history of the fish in this river and their health. Uh, again, this would be between 1,000 and 2,000 years ago. We looked at uh, carbon-13 and nitrogen in fish bones. Jim Chatters has been playing with some of this stuff in other contexts, uh, but uh, where we did try this with the fish bone that you just saw from uh, KT-12 and 13, we did get some interesting relationships here. The deeper part of the site and the, and the upper part of the site, there do seem, seem to be trends in the carbon-13. And uh, then likewise the nitrogen. We're worried that all those nitrogen levels are much lower than we would expect, so there could be contamination or, or degradation of the nitrogen. Um, the, the nitrogen 15 could be depleted, what well, it almost certainly seems to have been, but if uh, the process is even, you still have a nice trend there from the bottom to the top of the site. This would typically mean um, well, we're also comparing salmon with uh, freshwater fish to see what's happening in terms of the marine ecosystem and, and any of the freshwater fish in the river uh, system. Not that they can be completely separate. We're doing this with shellfish. Nate, you're here. Nate runs some of the shellfish work for uh, KT-12 and 13. His 
his thesis has shifted over to the Snake River and Hell's Canyon, where we have more samples done. But initially, as a pilot, we were including sight of shellfish from KT-12 and 13. We began that work because we were doing this on the YTC, uh, up in the Johnson Creek area, very close to here, at KT-315, where we were also seeing trends in climate uh, that were affecting tributary streams like Johnson Creek. Uh, as you go up here on the graph, your um, oxygen 18 is depleted, meaning the water's warmer, um, or you're getting more spring water, and then the, the oxygen has already been depleted in the spring before it comes into the, uh, the creek. Probably warmer temperatures and then cooling. So back in KT-12 and 13, uh, the, wa the water temperature from the shellfish seems also to represent warmer uh, climate about 2,500 to 2,300 years ago. Again, it could be warmer, we think that's true, uh, but it could also be the meltwater is more from the glaciers, it's more oxygen depleted, so it could mean cooler. This is what I mean about being frustrated by lack of sample size and a full array of tools to sort out some of the, the uh, alternative hypotheses. Carbon-13, uh, wherever you have more carbon-13 here, the deeper levels uh, have the, uh, the, the lower carbon-13. Uh, you could have higher metabolism in the shell itself, meaning it's warmer, or you could have less marine input, meaning less salmon are coming up here in this drier area, and they're bringing less of that carbon-13 in uh, in their bodies for the shellfish to also then absorb into their shell. Okay. DNA. We have been looking for DNA out of a number of different sites. Uh, we're focusing on bison first. Um, with Joe uh, Lorenz again, uh, Sam Smith has sampled about uh, 10 sites to see if we could get DNA out of any of the bone, bison bone of different ages. Uh, so far, uh, we haven't been able to get any DNA out of that bone. And as Joe was telling us earlier, it is kind of a hit or miss proposition, even in terms of, of the relative age of these. Uh, so no DNA for bison so far. Eastern had a little bit of luck, and the golf has presented some work that they've done with a uh, local uh, biology uh, teacher, high school biology teacher. Uh, we were hoping to replicate that work or, or complement that work, and so far we're, we're at a standstill. But there's lots of potential right there. So uh, our philosopher, and getting back to waxing philosophic, putting the word of archaeology, anthropology, archaeology, and collections research into a bigger picture. We do want to think about ethics. Uh, Democritus was a pragmatist. Uh, he believed in moderation. He had a reflexive approach. Um, we, can, we can kind of uh, translate that into our own need to consult and to collaborate and then tie all this work in ethically, responsibly, into educating the public about the value, uh, the heritage, and uh, uh, some of the purpose of the science that goes into uh, evaluating, but also along with other values, traditional values, arguing for its uh, uh, preservation, respect. So, the Democritus. So, uh, Democritus wouldn't predict about the future of our own. Uh, Society or how we're practicing anthropology and archaeology within our society or the future uh, of Native American and archaeological uh, work, uh, collaboration. But, uh, and I won't either. But I will conclude with some general uh, ideas, context. Um, you know, getting parts and understanding parts, a uh, detailed level understanding of collections, of artifacts, of individual sites, but putting them in a whole, and then putting that holistic understanding into practice, uh, social uh, commitment. Uh, Democritus ran off as a young person and, and studied the world as it was then known, mostly 
uh, the Middle East. Um, a lot of us as scholars, a lot of us as young uh, Native Americans, we do go off, we do explore the world, uh, but we do need to come home, we do need to find a place to study and work and live. And so we, we do need to think of commitment as involving leadership. And I want to thank uh, Wanaha for, for doing that for us and anchoring a lot of us in this area in terms of our, our heritage and just our, our, our curiosity to uh, understand the world. And then consensus. Um, pulling together the older and the newer traditions of knowledge Democritus was right there on the boundary 2,500 years ago. Um, he still had ideas that were part of traditional cultural knowledge, but he was also in, in, inventing in his own mind and sharing new ways of trying to understand the world as it was changing around him. So um, how do you build consensus out of the traditional and older ways of knowing and the newer ways of knowing? Um, we're still faced with this problem 2,500 years ago. The Italian artist who painted his picture 500 years ago, he painted his picture because they were having those issues, they were involved in the same, the same kind of dilemmas 500 years ago as they were experiencing the Enlightenment and moving very rapidly towards the Industrial Age. So I won't uh, predict the future, but I can go back into the past and find uh, examples of, of how and why we need to be thinking in, in these ways. Context, commitment, and uh, consensus. So I'm going to stop there and say thanks. Like Joe, if you have any questions or want to raise any points in discussion, uh, please do. Thank you.